supporting different studies that are just like Mr. Elder said here, that it's better to have children in a, in a situation that may not be comfortable for you, but it is for them. We understand that there is trauma to families. We understand that the system as it stands right now is causing destruction to particular families. Um, I have a client who has a grandson in, yes. in foster care in Glenwood, I think that's what it was, and he's never been adopted out. Yeah, his mother has got herself together, the family is stable, and he's been there four years, and they want to re-adopt their child. And we think that once a family, sometimes sometimes the time that CPS is given to families is just not enough time in order to perfect the things that are needed. And when there happens to be a failed adoption, or a bad adoption, or a bad situation, we think that the first look should be back to the family members of the child's origin, the family of origin. Because when they turn 18, they age out of these systems, and then they normally return to their families. But here, we're doing our children a disservice by not allowing them to have contact with their families by not allowing them to know the medical procedures with their families. So by having a mechanism where parents can reinstate their rights after failed adoptions or other issues, um, I think that it's a great move. I think that the state is behind the curve. Alabama, Alaska, and the others that Jeff and Jeff here are, are, are states that have done it, and they've done it successfully, and they're moving towards success. I think Iowa is cutting edge, and we should be ahead of the curve. So thank you very much for your time. Hi, Kelly Myers, Iowa County Attorneys Association. Um, we were declared opposed to this bill last year. I sent it out again to our juvenile um, juvenile folks. This is. I'm just going to read what she sent back to me. Um, she says, I believe it was the position of all the Juvenile Justice Committee that this was a bad idea. I have a couple of cases where post-termination we've gone back and placed a child with a terminated parent, but you do not need to restore their parental rights to do so. We simply place the child in a guardianship with a terminated parent. It is a rare occurrence where it's ever appropriate and there is a means to achieve some semblance of permanency for the child without restoring their parental rights. And I would worry about this and what it would open up um, as far as litigation. Thank you. Uh, Jenny Dorman with the Iowa State Bar Association. Last year, we were kind of unsure about this piece of legislation. Since then, we've done a lot of research and we see that a lot of other states have implemented similar legislation. So there would just be some things that we'd want to amend it in it, in, in, into it to add um, safeguards. Or One would be to expressly say that if sexual abuse, uh, conviction of child endangerment, uh, and there's one other egregious. Drugs in the home. Well, the drugs in the home might not because they could be remediated. Part of this is that they would have got help. They're sober now. They've been sober and they can prove that they're sober. Um, it would just be those types of child endangerment or child abuse that are so egregious that they should never have a right to have their children back. Um, so we'd want that added as a parameter. So uh, I forgive it if the reason the trial was removed yes. was because of sexual abuse. Uh, what else? Uh, conviction of child endangerment with okay, child injury endangerment, child or death. Um, another child in the home was, de was yes, injured, had a serious injury, and it would be something that had to be adjudicated most likely. Sure. Um, and I can, I had the Colorado law, which doesn't always follow the language we use in our criminal code, so it won't be exactly right, but you have that. And then the second piece is when it says for good cause shown. We want something in there that expressly says that good cause shown would be that if, um, right now it's 12, we have 14 mostly because that's the age used throughout the other pieces of code, it's always 14. Uh, so you would raise the age? We would, now. just so it's even, but if there's That's a right. compelling so reason that it's 12, we're open to hear about it. That's just because of the way that our code reads right now. Um, but it would say that the child is at least 14 years of age when the petition is filed, or is younger than 14 years of age when the petition is filed, and is part of a sibling group, including a child for whom we reinstatement is being sought. So if there's a brother or sister that's younger than 12 or 14, whatever the age is, they would be able to also be given, you know, to keep them together. 
And then the final thing is something we talked about last year. Uh, after the hearing, or the threshold hearing, it would say that the former parent has participated in an assessment based on evidence-based criteria that supports that the reinstatement of the parent-child legal relationship is in the best interest of the child. Just to make sure that there's that evidence-based, peer-reviewed assessment saying that this is a good idea. If the child, did I, I think I read this morning that there was a guardian ad litem they could petition the, for the child if it was under 12, is, is that correct? Uh, yes, for good cause shown, and we just want to say that good cause shown would be the sibling relationship. I don't know what other, the things that, the other laws we were looking at, that was what it was always expressly stating. I don't know what else good cause would be, but we want to make sure that that is good cause. Yeah, we're not limiting, we want to make sure that the specific <laughs> definition is the good cause, but it's not too preclude any other good cause. Yeah. So. Thank you, Jenny. Julie Smith, uh, I'm here with uh, Brent Hutchins, Andrea Pyburn from the Middleton uh, Center for Children's Rights, and Brent has some comments to make, and we're for the bill. We, I, we are for the bill. I'd agree with everything Senator Edler said about the reasons for bills like this and the fact that it's in the context of a lot of other states that are doing it. I think it's up to 22 now. Um, I think I'd supplement, though, one of the reasons people do it. Uh, one of the reasons that states have created this is we do have kids who languish in foster care without achieving permanency. And these statutes are used in those states to try to fix that problem. If, if we haven't done a good job of establishing permanency, we can reestablish it with a parent who reaches out and is you know, doing, doing better. Um, I want to point out how little they're used in states. We don't have a lot of data, but this is, these have been around since 2007. And in the states that have these, the number of petitions each year is anywhere from like one to four. So we're, we're, it's really a safety valve for the number uh, for kids who are in a really unique position. It should be an anomaly. And I can show you guys the data if you want to see the uh, kind of what's happened with that. The other interesting thing what the data tells us is that in the petitions that are filed, they're often granted. So there may only be five in a three year period, but it ends up being a useful tool. And I think after looking at the data, that's why I'm in support of it. Uh, I agree with the recommendations the ISBA made. I also really understand the County Attorneys Association's point about using guardianship. Actually, the County Attorneys and Juvenile Court sometimes call my clinic when they have a parent like that that needs a, an attorney to help them get guardianship, and we've done it a couple times. I can tell you, though, that from the parent's point of view and the kid's point of view, it's not a satisfying alternative to them. Um, but, it, but it is a good alternative to try to fix the problem in the way that we have right now, right? But I don't know if it's, I think any, any parent or kid I've worked with in that situation would tell me they'd rather be able to do an adoption. Um, the other thing I think we have to think about, uh, in addition to the age issue, because the ISBA is correct, you know, mo in most states we're looking at 14 or so as the kind of age when it happens. And that is the age when a child in Iowa can consent, has to consent to an adoption. It's an age where we ramp up the amount of participation they have in the China proceeding, like appearing at court. I think it would fit overall within our code nicely. Um, I wouldn't oppose 12 necessarily, but I'm just telling you that's a, that's a place where, where we do it. Um, the other piece is this law would not address what our friend from FUAN, Fon, uh, uh, raised about failed adoptions. This bill focuses on cases where there's been no achievement of permanency. Washington State recently amended their code to say that in addition to cases of not achieving permanency, it's available in cases where like permanency hasn't been sustained. The, the downside to taking that approach though, there is a downside, the downside to potentially taking that extra approach is it could put kids in a position where they want to disrupt their, their permanent placement because they're still trying to get back home, right? And, and you have to think about that, but, I, but in the states that have it, you know, the, the stats aren't bad about how often we have those. And that was one reason I wanted to address the fiscal note Fiscal note's bigger than I would guess. Uh, you know, I'm not an expert on numbers or what it's going to cost at all, but I would say that given the small number of petitions in the states that have this, I wouldn't see it as a million dollar proposition. Um, so, and I can hand that data to anybody who wants it or email it to them. Um, I think that covers everything I wanted to talk about. Um, 
you know yeah. how well those uh, children are doing that have been uh, referred back or have been successfully reunited with their parent that they were removed from? There, there isn't any data that I know of. I know anecdotally of two cases in Polk County that I helped on where the county attorney said, hey, look, this parent needs a lawyer to get a guardianship. We did both of them and they've lasted. It's been a good solution. Um, and, but you know, no data from other states that have No, I mean, what I've got is uh, a report from the ABA called, and it's titled, The Sky is Not Falling, <laughs> Lessons and Recommendations from 10 Years of Reinstating Parental Rights. And, and you know, so that's the, what I'm relying on. And there's nothing in that data that says anything about how kids are doing post reunification with their parents. It focuses primarily on how many petitions get filed, what, um, uh, whether they're granted, and uh, I think also whether it has any effect on the rate of adoption in the state. And so far, they can't see that, but we don't have a huge sample size either, right? So, so just as a curiosity, would it, the guardianship continue a level of accountability, though, in that, in that situation to protect the child versus a full-out adoption again? The state's going to no longer be there to... Um, oversee the situation. It might not be the parent and the child's primary pick, if you will, right. but the reason that the, the TPR was done in the first place was because there were ongoing problems that were not resolved in a period of time. That's an excellent point. I think Senator Heather's bill addresses that by requiring about a six month kind of probationary period before, there, and, then, and then DHS could continue to supervise the case if they wanted to. You are correct, though, that under the minor guardianship law, that they would uh, they would still have to report every year up to 18. So, so the DHS cases could close before the child turns 18. Of course, if you only start at 14, you know, um, there's not a lot of time left. But uh, yeah, that's right. The, you would have a different kind of longer court supervision if it was a guardianship. That's true. But I think what this law sorry I think what this law actually does is it opens up the door. But what it also does is when we're saying it's not limited to this, limited to this good cause, then other good cause could be a failed adoption or the child has been rehomed 10 times or the child is. So I think that when we don't limit it there but allow a little bit of leeway that those things could be good cause actions. Uh, and I do I do get the, um, your, your hesitation. And I think that uh, when the judge is doing this type of order, that if a guardianship is transitioned back into full-on parental rights, that could be something that's negotiated between your attorneys um, to make sure that everything is moving smoothly, that there's a little data afterwards. Um, it doesn't have to be completely on. It can be a transition, and that's probably what would work best for children who have been removed to another place to transition back into the home with the parent being the guardian. You see the guardianship from the parent, the relationship, how it's built, and then when DHS is confident, then we could go ahead and reinstate the rights. So I, I think that it could be a two-step process. I think that the bill is written very well um, and that it gives flexibility for our, our legal system to work. Thank you. So let's continue around. I want to make sure we'll get a chance for response to so. Uh, Carrie Baldwin, DHS. You think this bill generally fits within the new tenants of Family First? So we're just monitoring. One thing I would ask, I know we did the 12 years of age. Uh, and I know Jana was here last year when we talked about this. There are certain instances of DHS and the 12 years old correspondent, uh, and I can't, I don't have the notes. Somehow they got misplaced in my file, but could you elaborate on that? Are you able to? I'd have to go back and check. Okay. I think Janae was here too, so I can go back and check. Okay, and I apologize. I thought I had all my notes with this bill and they're not there, so we're starting a little bit from scratch today. <coughs> but, uh, <coughs> At this point, do we have any responses beyond where we've been? I was just going to say to the 12 year old point, um, some of the bill work that we did last year and the year before had that as a point. Um, I think where we came from the 12 years old is that's about the sixth grade where children have an understanding and comprehension about where they want to be, where they see their life at. And we believe that that's a great age to help children, um, let children have a voice. It teaches them how to stand for themselves and advocate for themselves as well as you, actually, you hear their feelings. 
they're old enough to have an understanding and a feeling about where they want to be, what's happening in the case, and have a little bit more direction to what's going on. And I think some of the federal laws are why you see the 12 in this bill versus uh, 14. But the other states who have 14, is that correct? Uh, I think I looked at it today, and I think the majority of states were higher than 12. But I, you know, I, I, can't, I can't say for sure what the, yeah, I can't say for sure what the total is, but. <laughs> so 12 is standardly used as a lot of the law I've looked at, so. Um, but that still gives Iowa flexibility, even if we're at 12, that gives them flexibility at the 14 that we used to see each year. So I kind of like the idea on your, you suggested on the prohibition on sex abuse, child endangerment. I do think that should get asked. I think we need amendments to make this a better bill. That's very clear. This is a starting point to get the discussion. We're in year two of that discussion. Yes. Uh, you also mentioned the sibling group, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I'll work with folks to get those amendments. We'll, we'll meet again if needed. Okay. And, uh, we have the discussion. Okay. So, well, so you're passing, you just recommended it. I am passing. I'm signing off. I, I will, but I want to see the amendment. Yep. 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 Right. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much for allowing me. And could you please forward, do you want the I'll data sign it when, when I see the amendment. Okay. That's do, you, do you want the data forwarded to you also for Middleton? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can got you, it right here. I'm going to give you a copy and then okay. you guys, I'll, I'll email it to you too if you want. Yeah, email it to all, all we'll of the uh, Okay, thank you. I appreciate your input. No problem. Okay.